as always, Industry Hour is an opportunity for everyone to learn more about the professional side of the major that we're talking about and the major that uh, you likely just learned about in Engineering 1700. Unless, of course, you are an ECSC student, then you, you might have more of a vantage point uh, thanks to introduction to ECSC that you guys are taking right now. Um, tonight, we are joined by an awesome panel, which I'm super excited about. And then, of course, we do have Emily from CCPD, who's here to give us a little bit more information. Um, hiring statistics about about the major too. So I will stop talking now and I will hand the reins over to Emily um, if you are ready to kick us off. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. I was having some computer issues getting on. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, awesome, um, let me just get this going. So yeah, um, thank you so much for having me, um, you know, uh, as Kristen mentioned, my name is Emily Thiles, and I'm the Assistant Director for Career Development here at RPI. Um, and part of my role is working with engineering students in, in our liaison capacity um, through, you know, through things like this, workshops, um, and, and appointments as well. Um, so I'm particularly excited to hopefully get in front of some new students today. Um, but yeah, today we're talking about electrical and computer systems engineering. Oops. Sorry. And so I work in the CCPD, which is the uh, Center for Career and Professional Development. And something, um, you know, we do a lot with working with students on really sort of honestly exploring their career options, but also their majors. And, uh, you know, a lot of students do enter in, enter the field, not really, or enter college, not really knowing what exactly they want to get into. So one way that we can support students is really helping them navigate that process, how to sort of decide what's a great way or what's a great industry to get into or major to have to get you into the right career. One thing that we do often is every year is we do, we collect statistics from alum as to what they're doing after graduation. So we collect information like where they're going to work, what are their roles? What industry are they going into? What is their salary that they're accepting? Are they going to grad school? Are they graduating, um, but still seeking opportunities? This information really helps us to then work with, you know, current students as they then navigate the process. So a lot of the information I have today um, is really from this, this sample because it's really great to see what your peers are sort of doing. Um, so, okay. so. I wanted to highlight some employer examples uh, of students who graduated in ECSC, where they're going on to work. All of this information can be found on the CCPD website under hiring statistics. Um, so this is all, this is not the comprehensive list. Um, the list is extremely long of all the different employers that, you know, employer students in ECSC. So I definitely encourage you to go, to go in and just take a look for yourself. But I wanted to highlight just a few um, that are kind of pretty popular. And a lot of these were across both majors in a lot of ways. So Apple, Boeing, Cisco, Creston Electronics, Deloitte, Oculus VR, Oracle, Raytheon, Microsoft, Texas Instruments, um, Central Hudson, Aerotech, Convergent Technologies, Corning, IBM, you know, Honeywell, Intel, MIT Lincoln Labs, New York Power Authority, and Tesla. So some really big names on here that have, you know, opportunities for students graduating with a degree in ECSE um, for full-time opportunities, but also internships and co-ops often. So it's a good idea as you're sort of exploring your major, also exploring some of the companies that hire within your major or the industry you're interested in, right? The types of roles you're interested in interested in, I should say. So utilizing, you know, our hiring statistics can really be helpful and at least start as a, you know, as a, a good point as to some of the different companies that you could be working for. So I went through Handshake today um, to kind of see some of the different opportunities that are currently listed for electrical and computer systems engineers. Handshake is our career management system, and I highly encourage you to get on Handshake if you have not done so. Activate your account and complete your profile and start looking. A couple things about Handshake. It's 
uh, basically a really essential role in your career development while you're here at RPI. It's going to be how you set up an appointment with our office. It's going to be how you see a list of upcoming events, whether it's events or workshops that our office is doing, but also employer and recruiting events. Those are all listed in Handshake. So you're absolutely going to want to get on Handshake and check those out. But it's also a great job search platform. So I went in and pulled as of today, what are some opportunities that those students in ECSE could be looking for, right, or, or might be interested in. So there's a bunch of different co-ops um, that are listed. I just pulled a couple, right? So this, these are not the only things listed, but these are the ones I just sort of pulled that, um, you know, that were posted today or yesterday. So there's two, you know, electrical engineering co-ops. There's um, full-time positions as an embedded software engineer, an applications engineer, um, an, a, a software automation engineer. So this is really like, this is just a sampling of the things that are listed in Handshake that students should be applying to if they're looking for these types of opportunities. Of course, there's a lot of different job search platforms out there, but as I said, Handshake is our career management system, and this is where you would go to, um, you know, do a job search and see the different recruitment and networking opportunities you could be attending. So, uh, lastly is also salary statistics, right? So this is definitely uh, something that a lot of students want to know, especially as they sort of enter into the realm of thinking about full time. So I pulled a couple, a uh, couple sources of information. So the first is from our, I talked about our annual um, survey. So our future plan survey. So this is from the future plan survey of the class of 2020. And it's of course the, of those reporting. So. The average salary for electrical engineers was 87,128. And as you can see, we captured the range as well. And then for computer and systems engineering, the average was $92,062. So in this, basically, this is so you can sort of get an idea of what RPR graduates are making upon graduation. Um, you know, what are some what are the numbers you can expect to be seeing on your offers, et cetera. Um, I also pulled information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics because this is a really great resource as well. And what's great about the Bureau of Labor Statistics is they offer sort of uh, the information of median pay. So meaning that 50% of electrical engineers make more than this amount and then 50% make less than this amount, right? So again, just an idea of earning potential. This does not mean right at graduation, you might be offered, you know, what the Bureau of Labor Statistics is saying, but it's a good idea for earning potential and growth within these industries, right? So um, if you go to BLS.gov, you can get all this information. They have a lot of great information. I'm happy to meet with students to review some of these resources as well as they are expansive, um, but it's a really great way to sort of get an idea of earning potential. Um, so really quickly, the CCPD doesn't only do things like exploring your major, like I mentioned, but we help with everything in the career development process, right? So from resume creation to critiques, um, writing your cover letter, interview practice and preparation, um, you know, looking at graduate school, if that's an option, negotiating salary, um, all different things, you know, we've worked with students on networking, practicing your elevator pitch, preparing for the career fair. Um, the, the really what we can do to support students in their career development is fast. So just keep this in mind as you're going through, um, you know, go, going through your own time that we are here to support you and we are taking appointments in person or virtual, depending on, you know, what your comfortability is. Um, and we can do it through, um, like email consults as well. Um, so we really do our best to be able to reach students at whatever is easier for them in terms of how the meeting occurs. So I'm gonna uh, kind of stop chatting now. Um, please feel free to write down my email here and, and um, email me if you have any questions or need anything else. I'm happy to, again, support you in any way. Of course, you can make an appointment with us through Handshake as well. Um, on my team is myself and Kristen Kettering. She also meets a lot with engineering students. We also have Bulos Abdallah and Erica Carey on our team who are all wonderful counselors here to support you. So definitely reach out. 
Thank you so much, Emily. Um, we actually do have a question sure. um, from Collins, who is asking specifically how you make a handshake account, which I actually love this question because as incoming first year students, I know a lot of us don't know even what handshake is, and this was our first time learning about it. So yep. how do you make a handshake account? Yep, so I just put the link in the chat. Um, rpi.joinhandshake.com and so essentially all all incoming students were um we've they have an account it just has not been activated i guess is the right way to put it so just go to rpi.joinhandshake.com and you can get started activating your your account once you do activate your account um, you will definitely want to create your profile, right? There's a profile that looks a lot like a LinkedIn account uh, because recruiters can see your profile. They're reaching out through Handshake, through messaging. When they're attending career fairs, they're looking at your profile, trying to find your resume. Um, I'm happy to, Collins, I know you specifically asked this, happy to review all of this with you in an appointment um, or even a virtual sort of console. I can send screenshots. I can, you know, do a step-by-step -step guide, but rpi.joinhandshake.com is the first really step to getting that started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, so Collins, I hope that gets you started with Handshake. And then I would say, you know, totally take Emily up on, you know, a meeting <laughs> so that you can, get um get a really good handle on how you find all those co-op opportunities through handshake and also how you can uh, totally take advantage of ccpd when looking for opportunities <laughs> um does that does that help you out with um getting started colin cool awesome thank you so much emily as always we really appreciate you uh hanging out with us on a monday evening <laughs> have a great night everybody thank you bye um and now is the time where i turn the reins over to um actually we have a very special guest today um we have rama who advises upper class ecse students um so she has stepped in to help me because doing industry hour is a two person job and there's only one of me as i advise the ecse students this year so um, I'm passing the reins over to Rama, who will do a quick introduction through all of our wonderful panelists. Um, then we will head into our panel, and of course, we will end with time for student questions. So, Rama, the floor is yours. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to meet you virtually. As Kristen said, um, I'm the upperclassman advisor for uh, the electrical and computer systems engineering students. So when you graduate from the hub, you'll have me and you'll have your faculty advisor. Um, so I'm really excited today for our panel to, to introduce you all, or to have our panelists introduce themselves to you. We have two wonderful students and two great alumni here to share their experiences uh, with you. So uh, if y'all are cool with it, we'll start with just a really quick introduction from each of you. Um, and then we're actually gonna kind of split things up a little bit. So we'll do a set of questions with our alumni and then a set of questions with our students and then kind of bring everything together. So for our kind of uh, prospective ECSE students, freshman ECSE students, um, then if y'all have any questions, you can uh, ask them of our current students and uh, our alumni. So um, panelists, if you can really quickly just share your name um, for our alumni where you work. Uh, for all of you where you're from, and then um, if you're currently completing your degree, what it's in, and if you've completed your degree, what you did it in, and then if you have any additional degrees, and if they're from RPI or from somewhere else. So, Michael, you are first on my, uh, the first person next to me, so you can go first. <laughs> sure. Hi, Rama. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael. Uh, I am a junior ECSE student majoring in electrical engineering. Um, I've worked at CHA Consulting uh, as security engineering intern last summer, um, and next summer I'll be working for Collins Aerospace as a software engineer, um, and I am from Bergen County, New Jersey. Uh, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you, Michael. And then, Linda, you are next in my, <laughs> in my row. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Uh, hopefully, you get you know some useful information out of this session. 
I'm Linda Rivera. Um, I graduated from RPI with a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in electrical engineering. Uh, originally transferred from a, from a community college before going to RPI. Currently work at Raytheon Technologies, which is an aerospace, uh, aerospace conglomerate. So Collins Aerospace falls under uh, the umbrella of Raytheon. Um, and there's uh, many other businesses. Um, I've worked in different parts of uh, um, of the corporation, inclu including Pratt and Whitney, which is one um, of few jet engine manufacturers. Um, and I currently work for uh, on the corporate side, um, supporting digital transformation efforts uh, for the whole corporation. Uh, I am originally Colombian uh, from the capital, and um, I've lived. Most of my uh, time in the U.S. has been in Connecticut and upstate, where I spent many years in school. So that's uh, that's me. Thank you, Linda. And then now, Ivan, you are next on my <laughs> on my. Hi, role. everyone. Um, it's great to be here. So my name is Ivan Hamill. I'm a senior computer and systems engineer. I've actually been doing back-to-back co-ops. So I've worked for Axelita, which is a small uh, computer vision company. Where I had the privilege to work with a lot of great people. And then I worked as a systems integration testing co-op engineer at Western Digital in Minnesota. So that was another wonderful experience. Um, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, as you can see behind me. So yeah. <laughs> I love it. All right, and Himani, last but certainly not least, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Himani Kamanini. Um, I was born in India, but I've lived most of my life in the States and I'm a true New Yorker at heart because I spent the most amount of time in my life here. Um, I earned my dual bachelor's in electrical and computer systems engineering from RPI. And after that, I went to grad school to get my master's and PhD at CNSC. So in the field of nanotechnology and nanoscience. And once I graduated, I joined Global Foundries in Malta, more in the semiconductor side of things. And currently I'm actually Although I reside in New York, I'm actually part of a silicon photonics based quantum computing startup in the Bay Area um, called SciQuantum. You can see that, I think, like the background. And I, there I'm the director of advanced packaging. So I lead their efforts on taking various types of photonic, electronic, silicon, and packaging them into sub assemblies that we can integrate into our cryogenic systems. Wonderful. All right. So now, like I said, we're going to split things up. Um, so we're going to start with our alumni. So, um, Michael and Ivan, if you want to, like, hang out for a minute, get some tea, some water or something, do you? Um, but so, uh, Linda and Himani, let's to get started. Um, what originally made you choose your major or your dual major for, for Himani and what um, what part of your and what made you choose the part of your major's field that you wanted to focus in? Um, so, like, how did you get where you are, basically? How did you make that choice? I could get, I could get started. <laughs> uh, all right, so the, at the foundation of how I chose my career path uh, was my love for math. I always liked math, I like puzzles, things of that nature. In high school, and I was always attracted to that kind of thing. It was uh, it was fun to me. So that's really the anchor of how I chose uh, my career path. Uh, specifically, electrical engineering. I think it was the process of elimination. <laughs> like I I knew what I didn't like um, so much so as what I absolutely loved. So um, I think one thing led to another while I was going to the community college and was taking all the core courses as foundation uh, for um, what I would do at RPI. And I think just, I think I just naturally fell into the electrical engineering path uh, just because of the courses I was taking. Um, and, and then once at RPI, um, I think just by taking the, the different courses uh, associated with it, uh, signals and systems, and then uh, microelectronics, the, the contrast of that, I think I started realizing that uh, I was more of a system type uh, engineer, that that was more where I liked, not so much digging into the black boxes, but understanding the system as a whole. And and then I, um, I did a little bit of uh, robotics. I, so I was thinking I like that, that may, maybe my thing. 
but I always kept a little bit of an open mind because I, I didn't, I think some people know exactly what they want. They know this is what I'm going to do and, and going to be my passion. That wasn't my case. I, I've always been um, a little bit open to possibilities because I wasn't uh, really 100% sure. Um, and that's how I eventually ended up doing my master's that had a more uh, control systems type of focus. Um, and then what I did for my PhD, which was very different, um, involving optimization and imaging for um, solving of um, optimization of uh, cancer treatment plans. So it's a, it's a, it's a little bit broad. Um, but I think I was just always following my intuition as I went along. Um, but at the core of all of that is just my love of math and, uh, and problem solving. I think that's really at the core of it. That's how I decided what I would do. And um, Thanks, Linda. And so my side was, I actually had an older cousin um, that I was visiting for, I think his PhD graduation in Michigan. And, um, he kind of took me around his labs and his focus was on hardware design. So um, I visited him a year later once he graduated um, and uh, he had joined Intel in the Bay Area and Intel, the one of the first floor of the main buildings, they actually have this museum um, that or kind of showcases, you know, the history of Intel and, you know, where they are currently. And I'm a very visual person. So seeing how, you know, the hardware side and the software side function together to digitize our lives at that point was pretty exciting. Um, and so when I was in RPI in my junior and senior year, um, the concentration that I picked was more focused towards nanotechnology. And um, in one of the summers, I'd interned at IBM in uh, the Vermont area. And my manager actually made me aware of CNSC. I think now it's called SUNY Poly, but they were the first fully nanotechnology based undergraduate program, or excuse me, graduate program um, that partnered with on site uh, industry consortium members. So. I mean, like Global Foundries, IBM, Samsung, USMC, like there was a bunch, uh, you know, there and uh, they would partner for graduate projects or research work. So it was very unique because unlike, you know, being in a traditional grad school environment where, I mean, we had lectures and such, but really we were working with badges and, you know, kind of going into different labs and working on these multi-million dollar tools and cross-sectioning and working in the fabrication facility or in the clean rooms. And really working with these industry partners and seeing, you know, our research work go into the industry side of things. So um, that time in my graduate side really did prepare me to um, kind of transition seamlessly into my first role at Global Foundries, which was with this, you know, silicon photonics and advanced packaging side of things, because I was used to working on these tools. I already spoke the silicon, you know, the foundry side of the language and, you know, the, all the acronyms that come with it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of my journey. Wonderful. Thank you both. So could you both kind of tell us, describe what the the day to day responsibilities look like or looked like uh, in in your part of the industry? What are kind of some things that you do? Um, if you can't talk about details, you don't have to, but just kind of give our students an idea of maybe like how they're going to be putting what they're learning to use. Um, maybe I'll jump in Linda on this one for um, because sure. I'm more on the management side now, I would say technical management and people management at Side Quantum. Um, we're a fabulous entity and what that means is because we're a startup, we're not actually fabricating the silicon or the chips that we need, you know, the electronic and photonic chips in house. So. A lot of the work that um, my team and the company does is external with partners, vendors, you know, uh, these foundries and such silicon uh, fabrication facilities. Um, what we do is, though, we do bring a lot of the once the units are fabricated, the silicon's fabricated, we do bring a lot of that material in house and um, we actually do a lot of the testing of that in house. So for quantum computing, a lot of the work we do is not at room temperature and warmer, you know, temperatures. It's focused on the cryo regime, like, you know, sub 10 Kelvin. So working really, you know, cryogenic systems. So we've built an in-house, you know, test facility that's really state of the art that can take care of all the silicon and all the other materials we've procured externally. Um, so because I have a lot of roles that's internal, external, and especially with COVID, my day really is, you know, making sure that, you know, the global partners, the vendor supply chains, internal test teams, design teams are all really well aligned, including the packaging side of my, you know, team members. And so for me, it does mean there's a lot of meetings. 
um, because I have to make sure that, you know, I'm synced up with this whole global supply chain and, uh, in COVID, we really have to things like even shipping logistics, we never thought of, right? We really have to kind of keep track of a bit more. Um, there's a lot of internal meetings that we have or working sessions, I would say, not just meetings uh, to really work through the prototyping plans. You know, what are what are the designs we're doing in photonics, electronics? Because we are in, I would say, controlled stealth mode, you know, IP is really critical. So what is it that we're doing novel? Uh, how are we going to execute? It's it's something that usually a lot of our vendors, supply chains, not only state of the art, we're pushing them to, but really something extremely novel. So getting them to buy into new material sets and things. So there's a lot of literature searches and internal discussions and technical reviews before we go and take that information outside. Um, a lot of my work also involves kind of mapping out, you know, what is that next prototype we're working towards? Things like, you know, roadmaps and things, right? Okay, we have something we're working on right now. How do we handle this silicon or material? But how are we going to incrementally, you know, increase uh, that, uh, you know, the specs or targets that we need to meet? Um, since March 2020, I believe, when we all kind of went into lockdown with this work from home model, basically most of my day has been in calls and such. Um, but the good thing now is that uh, because a lot of, you know, in California and in New York and such, the COVID rates are doing pretty well. Then travel, at least domestically, has opened up. So after like a year and a half, I'm actually able to, a lot of my team or most of my team is located in California. So I'm able to go and visit them and uh, meet face to face and, you know, map things out and have working board, you know, these whiteboard working sessions and things and, you know, grab a bite to eat and catch up. So I think that's the new kind of thing that I'm looking forward to these days. Um, besides the technical side, of course, people management means, you know, you have to deal with like hiring, uh, annual reviews, budgets, you have to monitor your spends. We're a startup, which means, you know, we're not generating revenue. We have, you know, this, uh, funds that, you know, our uh, VCs and other, you know, funding entities or partners have, you know, um, entrusted to us to develop and, you know, exhibit some prototypes. So really managing that and making sure we get the, you know, the most out of the, the money there. Um, working with program managers, making sure schedules and things are there, but really I like it because it has the technical side and it has a people management side. So it's a really well-rounded role, um, but I'm really looking forward and enjoying the travel side, getting back to, you know, um, being able to visit the team and interact with them face-to-face. -face. So, All right. Uh, yeah. So um... My day-to-day -day has changed um, uh, as I have advanced in my career. Uh, when I was first hired at Pratt & Whitney, uh, to give you context, that was in 2013, um, I uh, initiated my career as an individual contributor, individual technical contributor. So on a day-to-day -day basis, what I was doing, because I was working on the military side of the house for the F-135 program, we were working on developing algorithms for the advanced sensing, sensing systems uh, in that particular engine. So figuring out what algorithms should go into uh, the computer system so that it would detect some kind of a failure and there's different kinds and different sensors. Um, and originally I thought that I would stay on that track, on that very highly technical track, and I would continue growing uh, perhaps in that, in, in that path. At, at this particular company, when you come in, they more or less lay out a, um, a pathway that you could take, whether it's technical or uh, manager managerial or executive. And I thought I would stay in the technical because that's what I like. Uh, but what, what you realize is as you start um, learning and as you start realizing the needs uh, of the company, uh, I was put in positions that I wasn't necessarily comfortable in initially, managing uh, work, uh, connecting people, making sure communications were clear across, or uh, presenting some kind of result to a, a leadership, um, things of that nature. And I think through that process, I started realizing that there was something else that I could do that wasn't necessarily uh, strictly technical. Uh, because when you work for a corporation, what you start realizing is that, of course, everything is uh, hinges in the technical work, but there's so many other things that need to happen for the technical work to be successful. Um, and also, like I was saying earlier, having that systems mindset of understanding the high level um, uh, of how things work and how things should work. Um, started leading me in a, in a little bit more of a project management role. Um, and I also started realizing the needs of the company. So this is a manufacturing company building very advanced uh, jet engines. 
but they're very uh, behind when it comes to digital technologies and how do you, in, uh, what do you do with all this data that you have and how are you going to take advantage of it? So I saw an opportunity um, to start injecting myself in that area, which was not my expertise necessarily, uh, but the analytical thinking gets you, it, get, it could get you many places. Uh, it's not really um, the specific thing that you learn, but the way of thinking that allows you to work in many different areas. So through that process, um, I injected myself in this uh, digital path um, and started in working different groups that were trying, are still trying to solve this problem uh, of, uh, you know, data platform, data analytics, data ingestion. Um, and I, I held different roles um, up to where I am now, which is uh, at this group uh, in New York, um, in Brooklyn, called the Digital Accelerators. They're essentially aiming at accelerating um, transformation in the digital area for the entire corporation. And, um, and that's been really exciting because there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of things we don't know, and we're, we're trying to figure things out. And I think that's where I thrive. Um, not in a very structured environment, but in places where there's questions and things that you're trying to figure out uh, still. Um, and there I work as a, right now, senior technical project management uh, manager. So I'm still very much connected to the technical side of things, which I enjoy uh, being involved in technical discussions, connecting the dots um, across what different teams are trying to do. Uh, sometimes there are silos of expertise, and so I, in some ways, act uh, as a um, as a glue uh, across the board uh, in connecting the pieces together as a puzzle, uh, if I could say that. Um, and, um, and yeah, that's what I do. That's what I do now. Obviously, there's always meetings involved. Uh, you know, reports that have to happen, uh, resourcing type things that you you have to take care of, but. Uh, at the core of it, what I see um, as my role is just uh, making sure that teams are uh, working together, that we're engaged, and that there's clear communication about what we're trying to do. Um, and I always keep in mind uh, the the mission and the goal. I don't like to work in um, uh, very uh, focused environment where there is no line of sight as to what is the goal that we're trying to achieve. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of problem solving still involved in in my day to day in different areas, uh, but it has evolved uh, from where I first began. So if you hear barking, that's my dog. <laughs> Linda, it's interesting you mentioned TPM, the Technology Program Manager. I did that actually before this people management side of it. It's amazing. So it was something that my manager encouraged because the integration of all the various processes and the people and the sharing of information, you know, top down and, you know, bottom up and things is very critical. So being able to like present to execs or being able to present to, you know, technical teams or vendors, internal, external. So um, there's various paths. If you're coming from an engineering focus, you know, like a uh, foundation, you can go to the IC route, individual contributor route. You can go the route of being, you know, more in the technical program manager because you understand the language. You can really integrate and highlight risk or, you know, who somebody should talk to or connect them. And then there's the other side where you can be technical or people pro, you know, management side too. So really it just because we're focusing on engineering and you know your bachelor's degree doesn't mean you're limited to that track. There's various options and you can switch between one to the other uh, based on yeah, your interests absolutely. and the opportunities. Yeah. I I totally agree. Um I think just having a an engineering degree of any kind, uh just is a really good foundation um, and depending on your desires at the time and as you grow, you can definitely venture in a lot of different directions. Um, I just think it's very sometimes critical in companies to have that kind of person that can connect uh, things at the high level and then at the very technical level. Sometimes there's a gap where that doesn't happen and those kind of roles are are critical to making anything happen in a company. So you can definitely go in with this type of degree. You can go in many different directions, and um, and it just depends on your your desires or the opportunities that may present themselves up along the way. Thank you both. And I do want to say we are not ignoring the questions. Thank you, Ivan, for handling some of them. I think we're going to get to those at the end. So we're not 
like leaving you hanging we are going to get to them i promise <laughs> um and so i think we'll do one more question for y'all um so can you tell us a little bit about if you did any extracurriculars or any electives anything that you took part of that it took part in like during your time at rpi that maybe wasn't your like standard electrical computer systems engineering courses um that really had an impact on you and that you would maybe recommend um current students uh take part in Oh, yeah, I could quickly make a note of this. I did not do an internship or a co-op, which I uh, absolutely recommend that you do if you have an opportunity, uh, because it, I, I just think it prepares you a lot better for when you go out uh, to get a, a job, uh, because now you understand maybe, you know, what day-to-day -day looks like or, you know, what you actually may like or not like. So I didn't take advantage of that at the time for, a variety of reasons, but I absolutely recommend that. Um, in terms of uh, maybe electives or other courses that I would have uh, taken that I didn't, maybe more programming, that programming just comes in handy. I think uh, if you go to grad school or even at the, you know, when you have a job, it's, just, it's a handy um, skill to have. Uh, even if it's basic, uh, I think it helps. Uh, so I would do something like that. And then completely outside of all of that, I did take some um, some uh, artistic type classes. And I think it's, it's sometimes interesting because we tend to dismiss uh, as, as uh, you know, engineers and things of that nature, we tend to dismiss those kind of courses, but I almost think like that could play a role in, in, your, in the way that you think. So I did take some art classes, some painting and things like that. I wouldn't, I know that there's, uh, you know, priorities as courses that you have to must take for your, um, uh, for your particular career path. But um, I would do something that's maybe a little bit outside, like really outside um, of your, of your core um, curriculum. Um, but yeah, I would just say, take advantage of all the internships, co-ops, if you could do that, um, definitely take the time. Uh, I think it's worthwhile and I wish I would have done it. I agree with Linda. Um, I took part in two internships with IBM. I think that was really helpful because they actually helped me figure out where I wanted to go uh, after RPI. Um, I also took part in a research experience. It was an NSF research experience. I think it was my, after my sophomore or in my sophomore summer. Um, so that was really great. Um, I did a lot of these uh, extracurricular activities. So, you know, there's these honor studies like Tau Beta Pi, Eta Kappa Nu and things and being not just a member, but, you know, being, you know, president of Eta Kappa Nu or, you know, holding another position, Tau Beta Pi. I think it was secretary at that time. Um, I also did like the resident assistant um, for in my senior year. So that was interesting to kind of, you learn people management and conflict management very quickly there. I think that was nice. Um, I wanted some de-stressing activities too. So. I'd taken, you know, there was a lot of cultural activities I was a part of or, you know, art classes and things like that. But I also took like ballroom dancing, I think one of my last semesters and I joined so late, but I really wish it was such a nice de-stressing method. I wish I joined that, you know, earlier. Um, in terms of classes or electives, what I've noticed that really is helping, you're, you're learning to problem solve, but there are certain analytical tools that I think, uh, maybe Linda can confirm or, you know, um, you know, add to this, but Things like SolidWorks, sometimes design type softwares, uh, SolidWorks or Cadence or whatever, where you can actually, you know, if you're envisioning something, you can lay it out and, you know, visually show what something looks like 3D, right? What you're envisioning, it really helps versus having tons of presentations or reports. Things like um, in work, usually there's some sort of data collection or data analysis. So being able to handle big data on software is like, I don't know, you can script yourself. Maybe it's MATLAB or Python or Jump. Um, you know, those are really helpful. And eventually, you know, um, as you move up in the engineering, you know, technical ladder side or the IC side, um, there will be some aspect where you you may not be a project or program manager, but you will have to be accountable for schedules or being able to deliver things on time. So some sort of a project management class, just a beginner one. So the basic things like, what does it mean to risk assessment, right? Uh, what does it mean to, you know, um, stakeholder management, these kind of basic terminology. If you enter industry with at least a basic knowledge of it, it already sets you apart and you can kind of assimilate into that corporate lifestyle much, much better way. 
Um, but yeah, I agree. I think getting the day to day experience with a co op or internship is so valuable because you really understand. I mean, at the least, you'll understand what you don't like about a certain environment and what you don't want to go for versus, you know, signing a full time offer and then realizing a few months into it, you, that's not, you know, the right environment for you. So uh, if you get a chance, take part in research or co op and internship, definitely. All right. Well, thank you both so much. So we're going to have you pause for a second. If you can, though, hang around because we do want you here for the Q&A in case any of the, the students have questions for you. Thank you so much. And then Ivan and Michael, if you guys can uh, kind of come back in. <laughs> Thank you both. Okay, so kind of similar questions, but I want to know from y'all, especially kind of still being here, what made you choose um, your major uh, and the area in your major that you wanted to focus in? And did you know right away when you got to RPI or did you kind of switch around a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, yeah, I, I started tinkering with computers um, in high school because my parents would not buy me one, but they kept old ones. And so my father was like, if you can build one out of the scraps, you can have one. Um, and I did that and that was really fun. And I got into a little bit of programming, not much, you know, looking back, it's kind of embarrassing, you know, you're like, this is super cool. And now I can do it in like five minutes. Um, but yeah, and so I did that, but abstraction is scary, right? I, I looked at computer science and it's like, it's the problems are so high level and there's so much research going on and it's really, really cool, but it's also really, really scary. And I, you know, like some of the alumni mentioned, I wanted to know how things worked, you know, I was like, how does it actually do the stuff? You know, what are the transistors? What are all little bits and pieces that make a computer work? So I chose computer engineering. And then I found out what I was interested in really uh, because of an RPI class. I took uh, LIHTC or embedded controls as it's now called. And that was a really fun class. I mean, the challenges you run into working on, right, the lowest level embedded, it's, it's really fast, but it's like, it's what they say about the how powerful computers are nowadays and they're like we sent people to the moon with something less powerful than what you have on your smartphone and in embedded controls you get to do just the tiniest bit of that right you get to do these challenges on hardware that's like 10 20 30 years old sometimes um or simulated and it's like how much you can do with some really truly impressive limitations just fascinated me right it's you know and so that was the problem space that I wanted to enter into and that I'm kind of focusing on is that low level, like, how much can I do with how little? Yeah, so, uh, first of all, in case you're wondering what I did during the break, I shaved. So really impressed with that. Um, uh, anyway, so I, like Ivan, am also interested in embedded controls. Uh, and that's because it was the first class to kind of make me think like an engineer um going through rpi uh, i'm assuming you're all freshmen uh over your next four years you're gonna suffer probably from imposter syndrome which is like a very normal thing for engineers to have kind of like i'm th three years into my degree right now and i really don't believe that i know that much i'm really like i'm pretty average at best i feel like you can walk to somebody on the street and they should be able to tell you some of the things that I know. But in reality, that isn't how the world works. And like, I am three fourths of an electrical engineer right now, and I do know a lot, but I needed something to kind of prove that to myself. Um, and embedded controls was the first class to, it wasn't like, here's a formula, have fun. It was more like, here's this puzzle, solve it. And by the way, when you solve it, I'm gonna break it. And then you're gonna have to solve <laughs> it a different way, um, which was a lot of fun for me um i got into like my internship for next summer will be in embedded controls uh as like a software engineer for it uh not gonna lie i kind of forgot the rest of your question Rama. i hope i answered it you did you did you're all good it was just what how did you get to where your your current major and and the area that you're concentrating oh, in yeah, so, so I am an electrical engineer because my sister said I wasn't smart enough to be. Um, she, my sister's an electrical engineer from RPI, and I told her that I wanted to be one, and she laughed 
hysterically and told me that I was not smart enough for that. Um, and now I'm three years into a degree. So <laughs> it, no regrets. Well, actively proving her wrong. So that's good motivation, as any. All right. So you both um, have said that you've had uh, internships. Can you tell our students a little bit about how you got those internships, what skills you think were really important to have, and um, like when you were applying for roles, what did you find that companies were most interested in about your your resume or your profile? Right, so this question right there is a lot to it because the internship process can be long and it can be scary. Uh, I'm going to plug again. I got a lot of questions about embedded controls, um, but I also did want to say that imposter syndrome is real, right? It's crazy, especially because of COVID, I think. I come back to campus after being like a sophomore and people are like looking up to me as a senior about to graduate and get a job. I'm like, no way. Like, you know, don't don't ask me questions about RPI. I'm, you know, I'm a little sophomore here. I'm still lost. But no, with internships, I didn't do any of my freshman year summer, mostly because I didn't really get how the application process worked, right? I would apply to a company I really liked and I'd wait to hear back and we'd go through maybe a couple of interviews um, if I was lucky as a freshman and, you know, then they'd make a decision and then I would apply to the next one if I didn't get an offer. And the problem is internship pro interview processes can take a couple of weeks. And so you can only get through, you know, maybe three or four applications before you actually before the p internship period is over, basically, and the offers start dropping because they've already filled the roles and so on. And then sophomore year, I went online, we had the arch program, and I knew I had to take a semester off. Um, I actually mentioned I did two semesters off. I was fortunate enough to do an internship with the computer vision company that they were they were local and I knew them and I reached out and that was quicker and more informal. And then I would get home from work at six and I would sit down and I would start applying. And I probably applied to, you know, 30 or 40 different positions. Um, and every company has a different application process. And, you know, if you reach out, I'm sure we can tell you about this one is longer and this one is weird and this one they'll reach out really quickly and they'll tell you and you, you're, you, all the companies work a little differently. They're on different scales, but it is an investment. It's exhausting. I highly recommend you do mock interviews because those are exhausting. And I flubbed my first interview because it's a very odd thing, especially the technical ones. You have to like speak through them. And so really finding internships as an RPI student is not difficult. Companies know that we're valuable and they want to employ you. But because of how many students apply in the ECSE fields, the process can be long and it can be really exhausting. And so you really have to make sure to a lot time to apply and polish yourself. And I got a lot of questions for embedded controls. Um, you know, th there were some skills that stood out. Um, I wouldn't say there was anything particular that I can point to and I can say people were really interested in that. Um, I just got really good at selling myself and that's something that you will work on in professional development 3, which you don't actually have to take in order after professional development 1 and 2. It's something the CCPD works great at. It's something that the clubs, I mean, uh, SHEP, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers really work on. And it's just practice. Um, it helped me get over my imposter syndrome, right? Um, even though I didn't get that many offers getting through as many interviews after interview like five or six or seven you're like oh hey you know companies actually want to talk to me i i understand what i'm doing i don't have that nervous anxiety that you know I, i'm like almost shivering because it's my first interview and i really really want it and so once you've done more of them and you're comfortable that confidence really comes through and i think that's what helped me the most you know it's not really a specific technical skill it's it's those soft skills that confidence in yourself you know when you when you fake it, recruiters can tell. They interview a lot of people. Yeah, I uh, I can definitely vouch for that. Uh, I mean, I'll get to that in a minute. But so I was lucky enough to intern at CHA Consulting 
Um, and I got the internship basically, it was actually, so it was last summer, uh, I was supposed to do Arch, but I didn't because I don't like it. Quick plug to skip it. Anyway, um, so I went through an interview process with a bunch of companies, didn't get any offers. Um, and it was, it's really, really, like really demoralizing. When you get a lot of no's, it's really hard to apply again. And, you know, it's like, oh, you got your first interview, but you didn't get the job. So what good is an interview without a job? Um, so it's kind of like setting these little goals for myself. Um, and eventually I was like, I give up, I'm going to do Arch. Um, and then I was actually contacted from somebody at RPI and they were like, hey, we saw your resume and we think that you'd be a really good fit for this job. Uh, do you mind interviewing with me? And then I'll send you over to the company. Um, so I wore a suit and tie to this interview and I found out that it wasn't an interview. She was just wanted to talk to me. Um, so I didn't have to wear the suit and tie. Uh, and basically she was like, oh, I, I see you took this very seriously. Like I'm gonna send you over. Uh, so I had that interview, um, had the, the, uh, the next interview with my boss and I pretty much, I got the job. He, we hit it off really well. No technical questions, just straight finding out how I am as a person. Um, and I asked him three months into my internship, I said, uh, hey, Mike, why, why'd you hire me? I was like, I know what I know. I'm, I don't know that much. Uh, and to quote him, he said, Mike, you were the best bullshitter I interviewed. Um, and I wanted somebody that can, I could bullshit with. And I was like, good enough for me. Um, so like Ivan said, even though I had a job, I kept applying to jobs for the next summer because complacency is bad and don't do that. So I kept applying. I actually had an interview with Western Digital. I guess they took Ivan over me, whatever. Um, but I, uh, so I actually had three offers this fall for internships for next summer. Um, ones with Collins, I uh, had another from General Motors and I had another from Edwards Life Sciences. Um, and the reason, like kind of the, the, my interview process skills are, damn, I better hire myself. Like if you don't believe that you should be hired, they're not gonna hire you. Um, and I kind of, I actually haven't had that many tactical interviews. Um, most of my interviews have just been like how I am as a person. Um, and as you can kind of tell, I'm allowed, I like to be funny and I'm, I'm very personable. Um, and I've always tried to get some sort of interaction with my recruiter um, and interviewer in a way that's beyond an, inter uh, an interview. Uh, for example, when I was interviewing with General Motors, it was for a position in Ohio. Uh, so I, I was talking to the guy about football for 10 minutes uh, and I went out of my way to like ask him a question like, oh, what is your favorite football team? Because there's a few in Ohio. Um, so I guess my advice for internships and interviews is you're not supposed to know a lot. Like they know that, you know that. They want somebody that's A, teachable, and B, not gonna be annoying to work with. Cause you know, as an intern, you're gonna be under your boss's wing a lot. And me and my boss spent more time together than I'd probably like to admit. And you know, it, it's, if we didn't like each other, this process would have been terrible. But um, I can safely say that we got along really well. I got along with everybody in my company really well. Um, and you know, on my resume, when they look at it, they see, I have a few embedded controls projects. Um, my recommendation is to do a project on your own. Um, because how, like, th there's no better project than to do something by yourself with nobody watching. Um, and as Ivan can also attest, I have the self-driving car from embedded controls on my resume. And I was actually in an interview with somebody and they said, I know you went to RPI and I said, I, I did. And they were like, yeah, that self-driving car, every RPI kid has it. And I said, yeah, we all took the same class. So um, yeah, I definitely in, uh, encourage you to do your own projects and kind of just like be yourself and you're gonna have to break out of the shell of I'm scared, I'm, I don't. Just, just the worst thing that happens is they say no. They're not gonna call your parents and say how terrible you are unless you really make them mad. So just like enjoy it, just talk. They're, they're another person on the end of the call. Um, it's not that bad. You get a lot of no's, you deal with it, it's life. Um, yeah, that, that's my take on internships and interviews. Yeah, Thank you. To, oh, go ahead, no, no, no. Yeah, no, I did wanna say a little briefly, I forgot to mention, don't limit yourself to internship sources, right? Handshake is fantastic. There's a lot of opportunities there. 
but I mean, some of you guys may be using Piazza. It's like this weird Facebook for classes platform. I got my offer from Western Digital through there, right? They reach out through the oddest places. So make sure that your resume is polished and you put it up on Piazza, on LinkedIn, on Handshake, your clubs, your professional societies may have their own career sites. You can actually go to companies that you particularly want and apply through there, right? So just make sure that you put yourself out there. Um, and, you know, like Michael said, make sure you relate to your recruiter. When I get questions for embedded controls, it's because the recruiters are often RPI grads and they're like, I remember that class because it hasn't changed too much in the past, you know, a couple of years. And so you can relate to that or uh, you can relate to, like you said, football. You know, I relate to someone going hiking for my interview for Western Digital. And so the last thing I want to say about the process is just to illustrate how nerve wracking can be. I'm finishing my fall semester co-op. I need a co-op for the spring, which is my official away semester. And I've started applying in September and all I've had are no's. And it's mid-November, like November 10th. And November 10th, I have zero offers. And like November 18th, I have five, right? I, I thought I was going to have to come back to school. I'm planning my course load. You know, I sign up for classes. And then you just never know when it's going to happen or who's going to reach out. So it's it's super scary and it can be super depressing, but you just have to keep applying, keep putting yourself out there. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. And also just to kind of add on to that about the applying different places, you should I, I cannot stress enough that on LinkedIn at the end of this, you should be connecting with Linda um, and Hamani like so fast. Like these are people in industry that have power to hire, not saying that they will, but like it's things like this that are going to kind of jumpstart your career. Um, I remember when I was applying for my first job and got so many no's, I was sitting in my barber's chair and I was like, hey, you know anyone? Uh, and it's kind of just like talking to everybody that you know. And, you know, if like, the blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while, like if you send out 100 applications, you might get one yes and that's all you need. Uh, and every upper class is going to tell you the same thing just to keep applying. You're eventually going to find something. And I also thought that was stupid and it is, but just do it. It works. Like everybody will say, nobody applied to one company and got the offer. We all applied to 40, 50 and we got a few. Um, and it's definitely beneficial in the long run. All right, so we'll do one more question. I know that both of y'all are really involved in some of our like ECSC related student groups. So can you tell us a little bit about the extracurriculars that you're involved in and how you think they've helped like complement your, your academic experience? And then if you're involved in any extracurriculars that are not ECSC related or you've taken any like non ECSC classes like your Haas courses, free electives that you thought were really beneficial um, that that you would kind of recommend to to our students. Right, yeah, so. I've gotten a lot of help from my clubs, mostly because the CCPD is a fantastic resource, but sometimes for that extra bit of polish and that extra bit of confidence you need, uh, I think the ECSC department is a fantastic community, right? The faculty is fantastic. The administration is super helpful and the students get it, right? We, we mentioned imposter syndrome. I still feel like a freshman. I'm just a little older, right? We, we don't really change. We're not like grumpy or intimidating. Um, and so a lot of my polish and a lot of my opportunities came from upperclassmen who went through the application process. And they're like, this is what people commented on my resume. This is what I got asked about at these companies. And then I'm like, okay, so let me start tailoring it, right? Let me start, how do I sell myself the best? And if you're friends with people, they know why you're impressive often better than you do yourself. And so Shep, where I had some upperclassmen, you know, uh, one just graduated and started working for Microsoft. And, you know, Adrian was a fantastic resource for me. Um, I would go, he would roast my resume, as he calls it, like every three weeks. Um, and it was so helpful. Uh, I'm also currently the president of IEEE, which is a fantastic worldwide organization. Um, it went defunct in 2015. We, a friend of mine started back up in 2019. And so now I'm the president and it's been, it's been a wild ride, right? COVID hit just as we did everything. And so it is a little newer, but there's, I would highly recommend it to everyone here for really two reasons. First of all, the organization IEEE is pretty much unanimous throughout electrical engineering, computer engineering. If you look at 
in your classes, you'll read like IEEE 851.3 standard. And it's because they set the standards, almost all the faculty are members. And it's a fantastic place to get leadership because since we're newer, you get to kind of decide the direction, you get to hold events and that looks great on your resume because it shows leadership, it shows soft skills. Um, and you get to plug yourself a little bit and the cache is definitely still there. We're actually compiling a resume book, uh, which we're going to send out to IBM tonight, right? They reached out and they're like, yeah, absolutely. Um, IEEE is a club, so we're open to anyone, even if you're not strictly an ECSC member, which I know everyone here is, or undeclared actually. There's plenty of societies in robotics and quantum computing and power. Um, so I would definitely plug that, right? Give us a quick Google, join the Discord. Um, and the final thing I'd like to say is don't spread yourself too thin. I joined a lot of clubs as a freshman because everything is new and everything is interesting, but you don't have time for it all especially at RPI. And so I'm in water polo, right? That's my social club. It's where I go to unwind recently because uh, the pool has to be clean and we haven't been practicing. I'm like getting into outing club and it's just important to do things that, you know, aren't directly related to how do I get a job and, you know, how do I advance myself academically? Just pick a social club or two that you find interesting and go for it. I attended ballroom dancing. That was super fun, but I was really bad at it and I was a better swimmer. So I decided to do water polo instead. Um, so, you know, just reach out. I know people get super passionate about everything here at RPI and that's why I love it, right? When you hear someone talk about 20 minutes about, you know, the hikes they go into in the Adirondacks and you're like, yeah, you know, I've never hiked before, but it sounds super cool. Um, so, don't stretch yourself too thin, but especially as freshmen, try out a couple clubs and, you know, find one where you like the community, where you like the people. Um, all of the clubs operate a little differently. Um, you know, motorsports, embedded uh, engineering and so on. And just find one that you like and, and stick with it. And do try and be in the professional organization for your particular major. Yeah, so um, like Ivan said, IEEE is really cool. Um, I'm in IEEE, um, I'm the secretary of Ada Kappa Nu, which is the ECSE Honor Society. Um, that's been really cool to be a part of uh, because if you think you know a lot and then you talk to somebody else and then you're like, wow, they know a lot more than me. It's definitely like, it's a humbling experience. It also is a learning experience, uh, which is really big uh, because as electrical engineers and computer systems, you're never, you never stop learning. Each day, you you probably learn something new, and if you think you know it all, you pro like you you're far off the deep end. So, Ada Kappa Nu was a really good way to kind of implement that into me. Um, in terms of classes, or in terms of, in terms of clubs, that's really all I'm part of uh, because I'm somebody that I really like to just sit and do nothing because that's how I wind down. Uh, school's very stressful, um, and you know. I could be join a lot of things and just have more meetings to attend. But for me, I was like, I want time to do whatever I please to do. Um, classes that I took that were um, really beneficial for me uh, to kind of like think away from engineering. Um, I'm taking a class right now called Applied Game Theory. Um, and it's all about like decision making within economics. And that has taught me a lot about how the world works. Because, you know, when we think something is, en en engineering is a way of thought, it's whatever you agree is, you're just a problem solver. And finding new ways to solve problems is what this degree is all about. And I think applied game theory was another way to solve a, a cool problem. And I think it just, it kind of adds to my knowledge about if I'm choosing between two things, how am I going to choose between these two? Um, so definitely really beneficial. Um, and I guess the last thing I have to say was, I so for me, although I'm not in every uh, clubs and, and whatnot, uh, being able to step away from everything and be able to calm down, take it, not take a day off, but kind of like give my mind some rest was really important. I mean, I play soccer three, four times a week with the same group of people um, up at ECAD. And, you know, we started off as strangers and now we're all pretty good friends. and. We kind of know a lot about each other and we're all there for the same reason. A, we like to play soccer and B, God, I don't want to do homework and I don't want to study. And I just want to be able to kick a ball around for two hours and not think about all the stress that the school causes. Um, 
So I think as important as it is to study and kind of be on top of everything, it's also equally as important to know when, you, when you've had a limit and how to wind down, uh, which I think is a good thing for clubs like the Outing Club. Going on a hike, I'm sure you're not thinking about your differential equations exam. Thank you both so much. And thank you, Linda, for those like really great tidbits in the chat too. I want to like copy those, put them up on my office wall for like everyone that comes in. So now we're all back. And I think Kristen, if it's okay with you, we might shift to the, the Q and A. Um, Cause we do have a, a couple of questions in there and you know, that'll give everyone a chance to, to get to them. And then as we're answering questions to panelists, please feel free to like add, expand. If there's anything that you feel like we might've missed that you want to touch on, like, please, you know, and you see an opening, like dive, dive right in. Yes, absolutely. And I was saving the questions as we went along. Um, so if anyone else has questions as we're doing this Q&A, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, there should even be time if you want to unmute your mic too to ask the question. Um, but the first one, um, the first question that we have is going back to talking about courses. And I thought this was a great opportunity to kind of talk about, and I, I kind of thought, um, Rama, you might want to, uh, give us some insight, especially on those later electives too. So a word to the question as it came in, and then I think any additional thoughts on it would be awesome. Um, so it was, what courses as a computer and systems engineer can I take to pursue quantum computing if I want to? Um, and then the com or the question continued, and, and it was specific about programming. So I would love it if you guys would provide some insight on that. Um, thank you. <laughs> I think Ivan handled it A plus there. Those are the two courses I would suggest. I will say we have concentration. Just um, say them out loud because it's not on the recording. <laughs> oh, sorry. So um, ECSC 4964, which is quantum computer programming, and ECSC 4720, which is solid state physics. Um, we have concentrations this is a new thing we started last semester um, that are optional, but that can help you kind of decide how you want to use your major electives later on in your junior and senior year. Um, and so we actually don't have one in quantum computing, but you can make your own. So if that is something you are interested in pursuing and you want a concentration in that, please reach out to me kind of next year, the year after that, when you're starting to think about your 4,000 level electives, and we can 100% talk about making a concentration in that area. I can connect you to a faculty member who can help you do that, and we can get you set on, on that path. But Ivan's suggestions are spot on. I don't know if y'all have any other courses you can kind of think of that would come to mind, or Himani, if you took any while you were, while you were here or anything like that. I kind of entered quantum computing sort of suddenly. So it's one of those fields where you don't have to be like a quantum physicist or something to enter. There's a lot of portions of it, you know, like Linda's mentioned, you know, the whole technical program management, or there's, you know, the soft skills portion, or there's the design portion, right? Electronics design, understanding the RF side of things. There's the semiconductor packaging side. There's the photonics or optical side. There's the material science aspect. So I think it's a very multidisciplinary field. I think the, I was looking at the chat too, the courses that are mentioned, I think they'll give a little bit of a flavor on what it entails and things when you hear terms like entanglement or superposition, it won't be like totally foreign, um, but it doesn't mean you have to be a quantum physicist to join that field. So um, things like, you know, programming, I think that was mentioned, I think that's fantastic. Um, there's design sides from the computer, you know, ECSE side of it, you know, the, I think I mentioned some of the courses like SOLIDWORKS or a prob programming language, well, Lose my mind. Programming languages, I think, are really critical, right? Because if you can uh, expedite data analysis or like digesting large data sets because you've, I don't know, analyzed something or characterized something from a materials aspect or a cryogenic aspect, you know, you can have like a quicker cycle time of learning. So um, I think what Ivan and uh, Rama have mentioned are the critical ones because I'm, I'm not as well versed with, you know, the um, syllabus that's offered or, you know, the courses that are offered in the, you know, in the recent past, but those seem to be good ones for a starting point. And I will say, Collins, too, if you reach out to me and get your info from, from Kristen, um, I can send you the syllabus for um, quantum computer programming so you can take a look at exactly what is, is used in the course, and hopefully that will kind of answer some of your questions. 
which is it's a really cool way to have some insight into that later curriculum too because as a first year none of these decisions you have to make <laughs> right now you know you're about to learn so much about these majors um so it's nice to know what the options are so that as you get closer to having to pick those electives um you know you you can kind of feel confident about the choices that you're going to make with them um and also it's really nice to hear you hamani say how many different aspects there are to it because it kind of proves that with curriculum sometimes the good choice is the thing that interests you now and then you get into your career and your career is very very long and, <laughs> and things are going to come up and you're going to learn more um and i i think that's all really important um sorry did anyone else want to add to that um to the maybe even like the programming or or yeah, specific actually, courses that help i want to add a little bit about what you said at the end that you know your career can be very long and i'm sure that linda and himani know more about this but a lot of companies especially in the fields you mentioned uh collins will actually encourage you and at least you know pay part of your way if Afterwards, you say, hey, I know a little bit about quantum computing. I'm really interested in getting my PhD here or getting a master's in robotics, right? So you don't have to stress about it too much. Uh, if you demonstrate interest at your company, you know, at a company that does these things, they want you to learn more. You know, why wouldn't they want that? So you don't need to graduate an expert in your field. Um, you know, that'll come later. You have plenty of time for that. I agree with what Ivan has said. You're basically building a foundation for how to learn and how to program, you know, uh, problem solve. There may be certain aspects, you know, that calculus or differential equations that you've taken, you may really do need to apply to your immediate, you know, job right out of, you know, RPI. But in a lot of cases, that's not the only thing, right? It's it's a it's a tool set that you've learned or gleaned in various courses you've taken. So um, being aware of your environment is really critical, right? Like understanding, um, you know, what order things are done. So being very logical about things, you know, the whole problem solving side, I think is the most critical being able to piece together. And I think Linda mentioned this earlier. It's very key. The people that see the gaps in the process flow, or you see the gaps integration, or, you know, the, how people are communicating up and down the respective chains. Um, so if you're the 1 that sees the gaps and sees, you know, how to resolve them or fill them, I think being that problem solver and taking. More than what your scope offers, right? So maybe you have a certain role that you're defined, but you're willing to kind of, you know, jump into some task force that's there. The initiatives that you take or how motivated you are, I think, speak volumes too. So it won't be a specific yeah, course I, that will get to you into, you know, um, a yeah. specific, you know, career. Yeah. Right. I agree with all of that. And also keep in mind that technology is con constantly evolving and advancing so quickly. There are so many tools for, you know, all kinds of things that we want to do nowadays, uh, cloud computing and so many tools under that. So don't focus too much on specific tools, but more on competencies and understanding of the landscape, because as technology changes so quickly, you may be in a position where you're, you, you are asked for advice as to which direction to take. Sometimes companies are still trying to figure out um where where to go in which direction so think more holistically and um and more in 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 terms of broader applications and how tech and stay informed uh depending on you know the path you choose in career wise stay informed as to uh, how technology is changing what things are trending all of that is is good to know because you can inject that into your day-to-day -day at work uh, and it, it will become valuable more so than uh, being on like uh, other panels were saying, being an expert in a specific thing, unless that's what you want, because that's also a thing, right? You may just want to gain expertise in, in something very specific, which might lead you into being a researcher and moving in that direction, which that is okay too. That is a matter of choice. But if you want to explore different areas in your career, uh, then you don't need to necessarily just uh, be super focused on one thing only, it's more about understanding of the landscape. That that will become more valuable down the line. 
Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for for your um, perspectives and knowledge on all of that. It's really it's really helpful. And, you know, I think it's great to see it from the perspective of the student who's in it and then the perspective of those who are, are past that and into the career and how their education impacted. So I love it. I love the balance of both of these um, and kind of on the same note, um, you know, it was something that Ivan, you said, um, I think you said, I copy and pasted it, so I might be making that up, um, but you actually said that um, I do want to say that IBM highly encourages learning quantum computing and will post positions for it in the career fair website or handshake every so often. And I did want to plug that because, you know, even if you're not totally sure on where you want to take your career and based on everything we've heard over the last couple of minutes, going to like job boards and reading job descriptions is a great way to learn how to take advantage of RPI. Um, for those of you who have declared ECSE, you know, you kind of know the direction you're headed in a little bit. Um, and for those of you who are trying to decide if ECSE is right for you, by reading the language in those job descriptions, you're going to start to get a really good idea of um, what is ahead, what you should be doing, what you should be thinking about doing while you're in college. So I'm actually, I'm a huge advocate of going even, you know, starting with Handshake and just looking at those postings to see, you know, what it's, it's kind of like a roadmap to your future. Um, and, you know, not to throw off what you just said, Linda, about how things change all the time, <laughs> you know, five years in the world of technology is like, you know, a hundred years, but um, you know, there there are still going to be some similarities in what's posted now and what's posted in five years, four years. Um, okay, and then I think the last question, I've been trying to follow the chat, but I think the last question that I, I really have, um, and I, I actually think this is incredibly timely, and I can tell all of our panelists that this is the number one question that I'm having with, um, um, you know, my advisees right now too. So it's on everyone's mind, which is of course, um, how much do first semester grades impact employment opportunities, which I think can also be translated to, you know, what happens if I fail my first class ever? What happens if I see my first B or a C? You know, um, so I would love the insight on uh, from everyone on on this question because it's it's really important right now, and you know, it's midterms. <laughs> so I would I would love to comment on this because this awesome. is one of my biggest pet peeves ever so so to like answer the question does gpa matter definitely sometimes a little bit kind of like you know like i got my job last summer and my boss asked me two months into it he was like hey what is your gpa i didn't really check and i was like oh it's like pretty good you know and he was like why are you working here like you could probably be in a better place and i was like you know don't get me started but anyway um the the thing is having a, a, a good gpa it's one less thing that a recruiter can say to bring you down um because the gp nobody's going to say you have a three nine have the job because they want to know who you are can you do the job how are you as a person but also if you have a three nine they can't be like well this kid can't do anything because you have a three nine you're obviously doing something right um so to what you should aim for and like what is an acceptable gpa i'm going to speak like my father and the only thing that's acceptable is perfection. Aim for a 4.0, always. And it's very, it's not attainable. I've never had it, but I don't see a reason to not try for it because why wouldn't you try to do the best that you can? I never understood it. Some kids disagree with me on that. Um, and to answer your other question for like the CSC majors um, and like CS, uh, I think I can speak better to that, but. The CSE and CS kids are different in terms of what kind of programming and uh, definitely hardware. The CS kids don't do hardware. Like I have CS friends that don't know what embedded controls is, nor do they want to. Um, and CSEs, once they take data structures and light tech, you could pretty much do all CS jobs. Yeah, so. I agree that you can always aim for a four. I will say the ECSE classes are brutal, right? The professors are famous for, I had during, we went online during COVID spring semester. There was some cheating going on because everyone was online. Arch came around, the professors got it together. They organized 
I heard about all the other departments and how they solve their problems and, you know, proctoring exams and stuff. My ECSC professor solution for intro to electronics was, I'm going to make the exam so hard you cannot cheat. And he did. I did four problems out of a 14 problem exam in three hours, and I didn't even finish two of them. Um, and, you know, the, the exam average is like a 37. Um, and he curves it at the end and, you know, you, you'll tell to your other major friends, you're like, yeah, I just got like a 45 in an exam and I'm super happy with it. And they'll look like you're off your rocker. Um, but it happens, right? It's not like, it depends on the class. The class will say if they curve or if they, you know, or if the A is set at the beginning in the syllabus in terms of the GPA is something to make you stand out, right? If you don't have anything else and as a freshman, it's harder to get other things. Well, then it's harder to stand out without it. It's not really critical, A, once you get your first offer, or B, once you have literally anything else. Once you've done embedded controls and you can talk about it, or, you know, right, you can talk about the rover project, or once you have built a project by yourself, or you've done research, highly encourage research. Uh, all the ECSE faculty really like having extra students to work on what they're doing because they always have work that needs doing. Uh, just reach out. You know, you can ask your intro to ECSE professor and be like, this is what I'm interested in, right? I'm interested in robotics. Is there anyone doing research there that I can, you know, apply to research for? And you can do it for credit or for pay. So once you get something else on your resume, you get research, you get a project, you know, you get another internship, the GPA matters much less. It's just an extra thing to make you competitive. But if you have something else as leverage, it doesn't really matter. And then in terms of jobs, I've done more computer science jobs than computer engineering jobs because they have a lower barrier to entry, I feel. Some majors kind of, right, like architecture. Architecture is really hard to get internships for because you kind of don't matter. Electrical and computer engineering, and you know, Michael can speak more towards this, getting an internship earlier on can feel kind of harder because if you can code in Python, you can get a job somewhere, right? You can do IT or you can do pretty much anything. Um, and, you know, right now I'm actually interviewing for software positions. I'm interviewing, you know, with Google and Microsoft with for writing in Python, which is a higher level language that interests me less because I'm interviewing in Python I'm, because I'm more confident in it and I'm more comfortable in it. But, you know, I, I'm not set in my position once I graduate. I'm, you know, if I don't love what I'm doing, uh, Right, they have plenty of fields and different departments. I can be like, I want to try working on the pixel camera or on the surface or an AR. Um, computer science jobs are right. Like Michael said, they don't know about hardware. It's like graph theory, Q theory. It's all these efficiency and optimization stuff. Um, one of my favorite classes right now is computer hardware design because, you know, our final lab is going to take like a month and a half and it's going to be designing a microprocessor. Right. And how cool is that? And that's kind of the lowest level. And so when I, and it's all helpful. It's not like I'm not gonna get hired because I like hardware and I'm applying for software. Um, when I'm applying for software, you know, and during my technical interviews with Google, when I say, I know that doing this is worse than doing this other solution, even though theoretically they're the same, because when you actually implement it on a computer in the hardware, the hardware is quicker at doing a than B, even though theoretically they're the same. That's a pro for me, right? And it's a software position, but knowing how things work is a pro. So you're you're really not set into anything. Um, so the the jobs are different, and the technical questions you may be asked are different. But as a CSC, you can totally do both. It'll depend on your specialization and what you're passionate about. But there's no law that says you cannot apply to a computer software design um, job because you're an engineer. I just do what I like, right? Machine vision was super cool. Um, and that was a very programming oriented class, not a lot of hardware. But yeah, and I could. Oh, sorry. Um, oh. On the GPA side, I just want to add one thing, because I recruited at RPI for undergraduate roles and internships, especially as a first year, because it is a big transition when you're going from high school courses to, you know, collegiate level. The recruiters do understand, yes, they do look at the same thing. Okay, what, you know, if you've declared a major or a minor or, you know, what sort of courses, because in your first semester, especially, it's very tough, right? The resume may be a bit lean or have a lot of your high school activities and things on it. So if the GPA is low, there will be some that may, you know, ask, okay, why is it? If not, don't be hesitant to explain why, right? There may be a reason because it's the first time, you know, you've had this dramatic transition. 
there are people who, you know, like come from abroad, right? And assimilated into a totally new culture with a, you know, a second language, English being a second language. So don't be hesitant to explain maybe what uh, you had to overcome and, um, you know, like uh, how you're improving or, you know, what you've taken on to kind of address any challenges you had and then show, you know, uh, like how Ivan and, you know, um, Michael had mentioned, if you've got something excited, like, hey, I had this project and really dive into it and show your passion or, you know, I've taken this specific course or, you know, I'm, you know, have even in high school, I've entered here, or volunteered here or whatever, focus on these kind of things. And they're going to be talking to a new, um, I guess, like a new face, right? Every two minutes or every one to two minutes. So you want to stand out in that sense. So GPA may get you through that first point, but if you think it's low or they ask you about it, don't be hesitant to answer why, right? I mean, you don't have to share all the details behind it, but explain. There may be just a, you know, a very clear reason for what happened, especially with the COVID, right? A lot of you are learning and, you know, going back to school during COVID. It's not the easiest thing. It's totally new. There's no norm around it. Maybe after a year and a half, a little bit, but um, so don't be afraid to, you know, explain that and how you've overcome it and, you know, what makes you you, right? How are you, uh, uh, independent in that sense or an individual, right? Try not to blend into things, make yourself stick out in that sense with your experiences. Thank you so much. And Linda, I wasn't sure if you had anything to add to the GPA front. <laughs> the GPA, um, yeah, I think like I was saying in the chat, it is more important earlier on. I agree with always shooting for, you know, doing your best. I mean, that's why you're in school. You're trying to learn and be the best that you can. But don't get, don't get discouraged uh, if you're struggling with something because, um, you know, this will pass. I mean, there's many things that will come after this. So if I think more fundamentally, just ask, uh, ask yourself if what you are doing, if the path that you're taking in terms of your career is what you want to do, right? And I know it's difficult to answer that earlier on, uh, but if there's something in there that you're passionate about, don't get discouraged by uh, low grade in a specific course because ECSC, you, you're going to have to take so many different classes in so many areas and you're not going to be um, the best at every one of them. Uh, but if you are still passionate about the, the field in general, then just stick it out. Um, there are resources at uh, RPI. I had many wonderful resources, uh, tutoring, reaching out to the professors, just be resourceful. Don't um, isolate yourself when you're struggling. That's the worst thing you could do. Seek out help. And if you do that, you will get it. I am 100% sure you will, and you will get through it. So don't get discouraged by a bad grade. Um, it's hard. Uh, I mean, everyone knows that this is a very hard thing to get through, but you can do it. I know it, I've been there. Uh, so, um, don't get discouraged by a bad grade. And like I said, always, uh, analyze yourself and, and, and try to pinpoint your strengths. And it, that is very hard to do when you, when you're trying to be, when you look at other people, you can sometimes recognize what they're good at. And sometimes it's very hard to do with oneself, but try to do that. It is important to recognize what you're good at, what your, where your strengths are and lean on that, lean on that because that will, that will help you um, throughout your career in life in general, lean on your strengths and that will sometimes compensate for other things that, you know, we're not um, perfect, perfect at everything, but we are all unique in some way and we all have something to bring to the table. So lean on that, uh, identify it and lean on it. Yeah, Thank I just you. wanted to add mm -hmm. oh, so, uh, about the <laughs> the software and like CS and E's and CSEs. So I'm going to, I'm working as a software engineer next summer. Um, and just to kind of show you how much different we are. My recruiter told me, actually contacted me, it was from the career fair and she contacted me via my resume that was just in the, on the website. And she asked me to come by to speak with her from Collins. Um, and she said that she was getting CS kids all day, uh, because it says software engineer, but CS kids don't know embedded software. So talking about data structures when it's embedded controls doesn't really mean much. Uh, just to kind of show you like our jobs are different and I guarantee you Ivan could probably do a normal software engineering job that a CS kid could do, but they cannot do our work. 
um, which is why I think we're kind of just better, but that's just me. So that actually leads me in, and I know we're, we're past the time where I plan to stop, but if, if everyone's okay with it, I would like to ask one final question, because I think as first-year ECSE students, there is some confusion about the difference between EE and CSE, not for everyone, but definitely um, for some students, especially because it's a department that's so closely knit, which I think we can see from the banter in the chat. <laughs> um, it's very different, I think, than any other department in the School of Engineering. Um, but also, you know, there are undeclared students in the room who do ask, you know, they, you know, what is the difference between electrical engineering and computer systems engineering? Um, and I think you did a great explanation of the difference between uh, computer systems engineering and computer science. Um, for everyone who's listening to the ECSE, e, e, CS and not really understanding all the codes, which maybe I'll type into the chat real quick. Um, but I, I would love it if we could get your insight on, you know, even if it's just like one or two sentences, what is the key difference just to help with that definition a little bit more? Right. I just want to, before I answer that, I just want to huge shout out to the ECSC department. I mean, I think they have some of the most passionate faculty, and there's nothing quite like watching one of your, you know, circuits professors walk into the embedded controls lab and like look around at the room and what people are doing and kind of snicker to himself because he sees like students struggling and crying over what we do. Um, and, you know, he just starts laughing because he gets it right. Even as a professor, he, he gets the struggle and the pain that embedded controls can be and, you know, laughing with your professor over the problems that that can have is something really passionate. And, you know, huge shout out to Rama and the administrative faculty as well. Because of COVID, a lot of plans changed, right? You know, and I'm like debating, do I do arts? Do I not do arts? Do I push my graduation a semester? Do I study abroad? And right, there are all these things that can be really difficult for you as a student to handle while you're trying to do your courses and trying to plan your future. And, you know, there are a lot of questions here about planning your future and what courses to take. And, you know, Rama has been super helpful to me in particular and my advisor, Hamid. And, you know, anytime I had questions, they, you know, get me answered that they didn't know them. They'd ask and forward me and they really, gave me all the information I needed. And, you know, if whenever I was like, hey, I might want to take a semester off and do a study abroad, you know, it was always like, if, you know, this is my advice. If you think that works for you, like, I totally support you and, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that it happens for you. And I think that's a real privilege that the ECSC department has. Um, in terms of the difference between the majors, CSCs and EEs take a lot of the same courses, especially at the beginning, intro to electronics, circuits, you know, embedded controls, so on and so forth. It's probably about sophomore year or junior year that we start diverging and we can start specializing in power, right? I'm taking computer hardware design, which I'm sure has a couple of EEs, um, but it's you know, probably more tailored to me as a computer engineer. And, you know, other courses that are tailored to me as a computer engineer might be distributed computing or parallel computing or, you know, machine vision and machine vision algorithms. So I can't speak for the electrical engineering specialized courses, but right, that's that's the computer engineering course, it's really, it's the level of translation between writing code and running it and physically running it on a computer. That's what interests me the most. And, you know, that's why I came here. It's like, where does that transition happen? Why is it important? And how can I make it better? Yeah, I would add to that for like the EE and CSE thing. Um, not. CSE goes to a different component of computers and the engineering of them, which is really don't like using that in the definition or as like a way to describe it. But uh, as electrical engineers, we will step away from computers come a certain point. Like I'm taking a power class right now that has nothing to do with the computer. The only talk, uh, the conversation that we have about computers is how they limit us sometimes in terms of computation. Um, and, you know, in i.e. intro to electronics, you kind of step away from it, and then in microelectronic technologies, we, we will keep going away from computers, and we, we have the foundation because of some classes that we take, but CSEs go really in depth with it that I wouldn't want to do um, because I don't really care how they work, but there's a stark difference of, I think electric is cool and computers are cooler, I think electric is cool, period. Um, I think that's the best way to describe the, the two fields. 
Yeah, I was I was thinking about when I was um, in school, and I think for me, maybe there was a junction where I would go the direction of microelectronics and 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 that type of thing, and then the other side with what which was more systems and more closer to computers, I guess you would say. Uh, so you you stayed more on the on the the overlap with the, with uh, computer science. And I think that's the path I more or less took, even though I am not, um, I don't consider myself a programmer. I did kind of, I did take a path of that was closer to system design, control system architecture, um, optimization, and all of that requires some level of computer science uh, and programming. Um, robotics, that type of thing. So I think there's a juncture, but at the end, you know, when you're out in, in the real world, the the lines start blurring depending on the industry that you decide to go in, depending on the type of work that they do, um, and depending on how you decide to grow your career. So uh, I personally think that EE is just very broadly ap applicable. Uh, I think I was saying that, that maybe there is a, a a strict definition, but at the core with what you learn, um, you could do many, many different kind, kinds of jobs. I think it really depends on what you end up wanting to do. I think it really kind of depends on that. Um, but yeah, I think for me now it's a little hard to say exactly you know, how they're different. I don't know if that helped or confused you even more. <laughs> I think it helps because I think it speaks to the question, you know, <laughs> which is, I think that's why the question is there. So I think that is pretty helpful. And what you were saying about the blending of industry is, I, that's one of the reasons why I think industry hour can be helpful because, you know, every industry will hire almost every major, you know, like you'll see the mechanicals in every industry, you'll see IME, um, uh, industrial and management in every industry, um, you know, and tonight, you know, specifically talking about these two, you know, I, I think it is helpful to see what happens when you get out there and how do people distinguish them. Um, I don't know if you had anything yeah. to add, Amani. Oh. I just had one more note. So also just more generally speaking, um, it's also good to keep in mind that um, out in the real world in a company or even um, when people are doing research and trying to innovate, innovation generally happens at the intersection of all of these fields. They don't, innovation doesn't happen in isolation of each one of them. So it is important uh, in general uh, as a professional to be able to talk to other professionals in, in other fields, right, and maybe have as a, a, a way of communicating with them. That will become critical if you uh, silo yourself to your specific field in your little world is going to impair you from truly innovating down the line. Uh, so think, think about that as well uh, when you think about the different fields and what they mean and what they are. Yeah, yeah. and I I'd think just like to say that not only is it critical, I at least think it's a privilege. I mean, talking to experts in their own field is such a fun time. You learn so much. Um, and I think Michael mentioned, right, you you feel so humbled by what people know. So it's it's not something that you have to do. It's something that you're really lucky to be able to do, you know, here at RPI with all the different majors and the professors and the research and at your job. So don't don't be afraid to reach out and make yourself diverse. Yeah, and just to add a final comment, because I think all the other panelists covered it, but I started as CSE um, because I like the hardware side of things. Programming, I had to take a few classes and I think it's critical, but I realized I didn't like the whole debugging and figuring out, you know, a semicolon or a colon somewhere, you know, ruined everything for me. So um, I got through the basics there, but as I went along and I had to choose the concentration, I liked the microelectronics side of it. And I realized that to get a dual degree was just a few more courses, but they were interesting courses that I like, you know, on the electrical engineering side. So that's why, that's how I ended up. So you can start off as, you know, CS with, you know, um, uh, I guess um, a minor in like, you know, the hardware side, or you can start off a CSC with a minor in, you know, computer science. 
or you can add on and become a dual engine, you know, a dual degree or dual bachelor's with, you know, adding on electrical or adding on computer systems, which a few just additional courses, and you can still wrap that up in 4 years. So it's really finding what speaks to you, right? What class calls out to you and you really want to try it out. And honestly, when we're in the, it's, it's hard to go. Maybe, I mean, it sounds pretty logical. Maybe it's hard to digest when we're in the college environment, but things are still pretty, um, you're still in a very sheltered environment, right? Because you're taking courses and such, and you are, you know, if you're going to classes and you're kind of living on your own and things, but it's still low risk. Whereas that, you know, so don't be scared to like take another course that maybe slightly off the beaten path, you know, try something new because it's one more course. Yes. Align with wherever, you know, if your parents are helping fund or you're doing it or your, you know, courses, yes, there's some financial implication, but it's short term in the sense that you try something out, maybe it's just a, a few, you know, one quarter, one semester type of a course, and you can move on to say, hey, I really don't like it or I want to explore it further. Um, it's not always easy when you're kind of going off, you know, to graduate school and trying to change, you know, your whole thesis topic and things like that. It can be done, but you're at a point where it's still very low risk, especially, you know, in your first year. Um, so explore these kind of avenues, try things out. And I don't know if it's still an option. You know, I remember there was some chances like audit classes and stuff. But you can sit in a few sessions and if you like it, then you kind of sign up for the whole thing. Or, you know, you can draw, you can pull yourself out of a class if you don't like some of the earlier materials, something like that. I'm sure Rama and Kristen can give you more information on it, but it's sort of a low risk way to try out a class. Um, so explore those options. Don't be scared about it. And your final, you know, whether it's EE or ECSE or, you know, CSE, they're pretty close. It's the kind of projects you want to take on and kind of skill sets and kind of internships you've done that really determine it. You know how what what roles you'll get after that. Yeah, awesome. and what one last tidbit I have uh, on what I was saying before, and kind of complementing what everyone is saying. Um, so, for example, um, Pratt and Whitney. This is an example. Pratt and Whitney uh, manufactures jet engines for you know planes that you're flying or military jets. So very sophisticated um, hardware, right? Uh, but now you're trying to marry that with very sophisticated digital technologies and applications that can extract this data out of these machines and do something that helps them um, manage the fleet or figure out where things are wrong. Um, you may need, as you, and obviously depends on the field, the basic understanding of how a jet engine works just so, so that you're able to really understand what it is that you're doing on the other end, on the front end of things. So don't limit yourself in terms of what you should know. Um, and that could be in the form of a course or just in general, um, don't um, narrow your, un you know, your understanding of things because the, the more you understand the different pieces of the puzzle, the more value you'll bring to a company. Um, that would be my example for when, when I mentioned that, you know, innovation happens at the intersection of things. This is one example. This is a huge thing that this company is trying to do and you need people coming from all different sides trying to put it all together. So, um, be open to, uh, learning all these things, uh, maybe not, at, uh, at the expert level, but at a high level, it is valuable. Uh, I can attest to that. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much for letting me ask that final question. Um, you know, I, I, I hope, and I think that all of your answers were very helpful. Um, I think, I think you just, I, it, it's, it's just, you know, for those undeclared students, especially, you know, who have this interest in, you know, this area of engineering to know like how to pick their road through it um, and, and your insight is just incredible. Um, and then I wanted to say too, um, yes, you can audit courses. You can also take advantage of past no crediting and you take, can take advantage of dropping courses as well. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I refer to it as strategic planning sometimes where you add a course without necessarily intending to take it all the way through to see how you feel about it, um, which is a key strategy for undeclared students. And for those in the room, I, I know that you've heard me talk about this strategic planning before. Um, but of course, the classes being referred to tonight are definitely going to be, you know, 
once you finish up all of these calc ones and you know comp sci one and you get into the the more advanced ecse courses but that those options will be there and you know to keep plugging rama because the chat was all about that and i loved it so much um rama is going to be your advisor when you get to your sophomore year she'll be the me but for for upper level courses so you already know this wonderful warm resource that you're going to have when you get there um and she can help you um navigate you know pretty much 99% of the conversation that we had tonight. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope you're looking forward to it, Rama. Um, and on, on that note, I'm going to, I'm going to close tonight's panel um, because I think we've covered so much and I'm so grateful to our panelists to spend their evening with us. So grateful to Rama for being our moderator tonight. Um, and I just love the opportunity for you get to get to show off your happy face to our first year students, of course. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much for having Thank us. Thank you all. Yeah, it was great. Best of luck, everyone. Have a good night.